Thank you, Desiree. And thank you everyone who's watching here today and thank you to our panelists who we'll get to in a moment. Uh, I'm Corey Atkins. I'm Vice President of Public Policy and General Counsel for the Asheville Area Chamber of Commerce. We want to welcome you to the 2020 virtual version of our legislative luncheon. Uh, many of you have been to this event in the past, I'm sure, and so we're having to change things up due to the COVID-19 pandemic and we're graciously joined by a, a number of legislators here today to talk about that as well as the upcoming short session. At the Asheville Chamber, we hope all of you are safe, you're staying home, that you're healthy. Um, and for our area businesses, we hope you're remaining resilient through what is certainly a trying time for our economy. We hope that you're utilizing all the resources that are available to you, the best compilation of which you can find on our website at www.ashevillechamber.org forward slash coronavirus. You'll find a lot of good resources there from everything from the federal government, SBA, to everything that's being done locally, as well as all of our recorded webinars, town halls, and this event, uh, once uh, we are finished here today, you can find there. I wanna thank all of our, and give me a, allow us to extend a warm welcome to all the legislators who have joined us here today. Um, first off, we have Senator Chuck Edwards from District 48. We have Senator Terry Van Dyne from District 49, Chuck McGrady, who's our representative for House District 117, and Brian Turner, who's representative for House District 116. So thank all of you for being here today, and we'll certainly welcome your comments in a moment. But certainly we cannot do these events, and we can't get through all this as a community without important partners who help us carry the freight and do this together. Um, and with that, I would like to thank all of our sponsors you'll see listed on the screen currently. Um, this won't stay up the whole time, but we certainly want to give them their due. And uh, first of which will be our presenting sponsor was Mission Health. We'll hear from Dr. Bill Hathaway in a moment. Um, ERC Broadband, Pepsi Bottling Company, First Bank, Carolina Alliance Bank, and Fast Signs of Asheville. Really thank all of you for your partnership through all of this and agreeing to remain our partners to what we're doing with our events and trying to be nimble and still deliver valuable content to all of our members as well as the community through this time. And with that, I'll ask for all of our panelists to uh, please mute themselves and I'm gonna cede the floor to Dr. Bill Hathaway uh, from Mission Health to deliver some remarks uh, in regards to presenting sponsorship and the things that Mission are doing to help address this pandemic. Dr. Hathaway. Corey, I uh, thank you for that. Um, I really appreciate the opportunity to represent Mission and HCA uh, on this call. It's a pleasure for us to be able to um, be a sponsor for this event. We've done it in the past and we really appreciate the opportunity to get together. I don't think we anticipated uh, that when we chose to sponsor this that we would have such a significant role in the content that was going to be discussed, um, but I um, appreciate the opportunity to do so. First and foremost, a, a sincere and and a real thank you to um, everybody, uh, but especially our elected officials who are with us, Senators Edwards and Van Dyne and Representatives uh, McGrady and Turner, but not just to them, but to all the elected officials, both city and county and state, um, who have been uh, so instrumental in helping us as we prepare to meet this uh, unknown challenge that's um, coming towards us. Uh, Corey asked me to take about 10 minutes to give an overview um, of where we are and sort of a state of state of the virus, as it were, state of the union. Um, and so I'll do that uh, in about 10 minutes. It's gonna, obviously I could spend hours talking about this. It's consumed um, our health systems activities for the last month and my personal activities uh, for that same time. Um, I think everyone's aware we've crested 450,000 cases in the United States with 16,000 deaths as of this morning. Um, there seems to be some promise, uh, at least in the HCA hospitals, that the numbers are flattening or going down. And we seem to see that also in terms of hospitalizations in New York City. So we're encouraged by that. In North Carolina, we have 3.6 thousand um, uh, cases that have been identified. And again, that's a tip of the iceberg because testing is not um, being indicated for those with mild and moderate symptoms. And unfortunately, we've had 65 deaths. Locally, uh, it's been interesting. Um, we've been blessfully uh, behind the curve. Um, this is a party. Uh, that we're happy not to be invited to or to be late to at the very least. Um, uh, I think we can attribute in large part uh, much of that to um, two things. Number one is our inherent geographic isolation. And number two is the, um, uh, 
the foresight that, uh, that our county representatives had in instituting a stay home, stay safe order um, that preceded uh, the governor's um, uh, timely um, uh, institution of some travel restrictions. And I just want to emphasize that this has, in my opinion, had a meaningful impact on our ability to flatten the curve. And, and I hope that we'll continue this as long as we can, understanding that the economic implications are real and that we're going to have to work together to find a way to strike the balance uh, between uh, saving lives and, 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 uh, and then restoring people's livelihoods. Um, locally, uh, Henderson County leads the way with 55 cases, followed thereafter by Burke uh, with 42 cases as of this morning. Buncombe County has been uh, flat at 37, and then Rutherford um, has 31 cases. Um, the vast majority of these patients have not been hospitalized. Um, uh, unlike uh, other areas, our demographics have not uh, shown a prevalence for worse disease uh, in the minority uh, patient population. I think that's in part because we're relatively less uh, minorities in this part of the state. And I also think in part because we just haven't seen the, the crest of the wave at this point in time. We've been uh, preparing actively for the last month at Mission Health to address uh, the crisis. Um, I think uh, there've been other forums where this information has been relayed, but um, our current uh, capacity at Mission with um, uh, beds is about 800. Um, we uh, have a census which is in the 50 to 60 percent range, meaning we have about 400 open beds in the hospital right now. That's in large part due to two things. One, we uh, eliminated elective surgeries, which comprises a large amount of our bed utilization. And number two, the volumes are just down. People are not going to the doctor for the care that they would normally go to. And the emergency department volumes are down uh, almost uh, 50 percent in some days uh, more than that. We've worked collaboratively um, within the hospital uh, to prepare to open and surge. And when we look at our surge capacity, we could get upwards of over 1,400 beds opened if we needed to push to the limits. And this, of course, includes utilizing some of our capacity on the empty St. Joe's campus, uh, which includes a very um, state-of-the-art ICU, which we were using up until last uh, October when we opened the new North Bed Tower. Um, and then a variety of other uh, beds in that facility. There's a, an additional 138 beds. So we're, we're actively looking at ways we could handle a surge if we get that surge. In addition, we've increased capacity at our five uh, sister hospitals in the region. Um, as an example, Angel, which typically has a census in the 15 to 20 range, maybe a little bit higher as a critical access hospital, has the capacity to go up to over 50 beds if we needed to. Um, and so I think that there's, I, I, I'm not concerned about um, space in terms of being able to handle surge. I'm more concerned about um, ability to uh, staff the space if we really got hit. Uh, and so we're really counting on flattening the curve with the stay home directives. We've collaborated outside of our um, own system. Uh, I hosted a, uh, for the last four weeks, a weekly call with all the local uh, clinical leaders and chief medical officers including um, at uh, Park Ridge and party with Dr. Uh, Teresa um, Herbert at Park Ridge and Dr. David Ellis at uh, uh, party. Uh, this past week, we've added on uh, a number of other people, including uh, Dr. Paul Riggs at the VA Medical Center here, uh, Rick Bunio at Cherokee Hospital, um, uh, Steve Heatherly and Lucretia, uh, I'm blanking on her last name, forgive me, um, uh, at Harris, I have joined the calls. And we've used those to share best practices and to do uh, regional preparedness so that we're facing this as a community and not as isolated uh, health systems. And I think that's been uh, really beneficial to us. A couple key things I wanna point out um, that have come up with respect to where we stayed in terms of how we're approaching this. Um, uh, testing has been an issue. Um, I think everyone is aware of that. Uh, we've had limited supplies throughout the country. And while we initially hope to have testing uh, done, across a broad base to uh, better understand populations and where the disease is and which would be ideal. We just frankly haven't had the ability to do so. Now we're getting reagents. Uh, we've actually uh, now as of this week have in-house testing at Mission Hospital, which means that we're able to run samples and get turnaround times very, very quickly. Our turnaround times on the commercial labs is in the order of seven days, which is just frankly unacceptable if you're trying to take care of patients and conserve protective equipment. Uh, and now it's down to just a few hours. Unfortunately, despite the fact that we have reagent, we have limited supply of reagent because we're not a hotspot yet. We don't wanna be a hotspot, but we have about um, 700 tests or so, and so we're being very careful on how we use those. 
and we think that our um, allocation is going to be in the order of 100 to 150 tests a week additionally, uh, which is a little bit under what our consumption rate is right now. So it's a very dynamic uh, process. Once we get capacity and more reagents on a regular basis, we will be able to open it up and take care of um, other facilities if they need it or other regional providers who might uh, feel that testing is warranted for their patient population. Um, we, we are hyper concerned about the nursing home population. Uh, I, uh, not jokingly, but seriously refer to them as our stationary cruise ships in the um, early part of the uh, pandemic as it came to town when most of the uh, uh, cases that we were seeing nationally were on cruise ships. And, and they're highly vulnerable populations um, who uh, experience the worst side of the disease. And we are working collaboratively uh, with our nursing home partners and Mayhek and other folks in town to make sure that they have uh, the education that they need, the skills uh, in their providers that they need, restrictions on visitation, uh, collaboratively with Jenny Mullendor in particular to, to address that need. And so I'm hopeful that we can keep it out of those uh, nursing homes. We've had two congregate living facilities in the region that have been affected. One was uh, a skilled nursing facility in Henderson County. Uh, actually, they were both in Henderson County. The other was an assisted living facility. Fortunately, despite some uh, significant numbers of cases, and that's why Henderson County is leading the way in terms of number of cases, we haven't seen a lot of hospitalizations. We've had a total of 11 hospitalizations at mission uh, in our health system so far, and one death. Um, there's been less than a handful of, uh, less than two hands full of hospitalizations in other facilities and just a few other deaths. So we've been, we've been blessed that way. A lot of attention and question focused on protective equipment. Um, I want to assure everybody that uh, at this point in time, we have adequate supplies of testing, I'm sorry, of protective equipment at Mission. Um, there was a recent call for N95 masks for all of our nurses. Uh, that, frankly, is not a guideline that anybody in the country has advocated for. And when we have limited uh, protective equipment for um, other areas in the country, it would frankly be, in my opinion, grossly irresponsible to put N95 masks on all of our, our staff, regardless of whether they're caring for um, uh, affected patients. Um, we use N95 masks in the appropriate uh, circumstances according to CDC guidelines, and, and I want everyone to be reassured uh, that, that our staff and our, our patients are safe. We have gone to a universal masking policy, which is a much lower level of protection, but uh, provides adequate protection uh, for our staff members and visitors when they come in the hospital. And then the last thing uh, I would like to talk about is something that we've been fortunate enough to do, um, being partnered with HCA. This has obviously had a significant economic impact on us. Our cash flow is down substantially. Our volumes are down dramatically. And yet we're exceptionally and always will be very concerned about our staff members. Um, we uh, have been fortunate enough across HCA, which is a large 185 hospital system, a number of ambulatory uh, surgery centers and freestanding emergency departments rounding out the uh, portfolio. We have uh, had enough resources where we've instituted what we call pandemic pay. And our staff members who are um, uh, relieved of their duties temporarily at least through May, will be offered um, the ability uh, to be uh, compensated at 70% um, of their uh, current pay while they're waiting this out into May. How long we'll be able to continue that is unclear, but um, I feel clearly that's one of the biggest benefits that we've had uh, through our partnership with HCA. And frankly, as Mission Health, we never could have done that um, in an independent fashion. We just didn't have the resources. I will leave it at that because I don't want to consume too much of the time. Uh, really, this is a legislative session, but be happy to take questions and uh, participate in the panel discussion as appropriate. Thanks very much, Corey. I really appreciate it. Thank you, Dr. Hathaway. And thanks again to Mission Health for being our presenting sponsors today and for everything you're doing in our community. I uh, hope everyone takes heed of that. There was some good news in, in the midst of a national dire news. There was some good news locally mixed in there, but it's only because we're adhering stri strictly to these uh, uh, executive orders as well as local orders. So I hope everyone takes heed of that. I'm going to now stop sharing that, that screen so that we can focus more on our legislators who are here. I will tell the audience who's watching, if you have a question, please do not utilize the chat function that you'll see at the bottom of your screen. It gets confusing for everyone. It can cloud things up. Please use the Q&A function. If you utilizing the Q&A function will allow me to take your questions in the order that they come and feel free to direct them at one of our legislators here specifically, 
or feel free to ask a general one. I'll do my best to uh, spread that out amongst everyone. Uh, initially, prior to this call, I asked each legislator to prepare three to five minutes of introductory remarks. I really want the focus to be on the questions that our audience members have um, about the state response to this, as well as the upcoming short session here at the end of the month. And we'll talk about that in a moment and take those questions as they come. Uh, but I want to start with uh, Senator Chuck Edwards from, from District 48 to give some introductory remarks. Senator Edwards. All right. Well, thank you. Thank you, Corey. Can you hear me okay? All right. Um, well, hello, everybody, and, and welcome. I appreciate you taking the time to be with us this afternoon. Uh, on the way to uh, join in this session, I was thinking how materially different the conversation is today from what it would have been even a month ago, uh, were we able to get together. Uh, first of all, I'd, I'd just like to say, in addition to being here, I hope everybody out there is well. I'll be praying for your health and, and your safety and, and that of your family. Um, first, first of all, uh, particularly to my fellow legislators and to any other city or county government official out there, I need to let you know that there's a message from my wife. Uh, she is assuring me that in pro we probably got about two weeks to go until we're gonna be uh, deeming hair salons as essential services. Uh, so just, just, just a heads up there. Um, Corey, one of the downfalls of a Zoom session is I can't now hear the thunderous round of laughter that I was seeking to get, uh, but I'm, I'm, I'm sure it's there. Uh, I'd, I'd like to acknowledge, and you, you know, often we do acknowledge the folks that uh, serve our communities. Typically, it's the uh, emergency service responders, the first responders, our law enforcement, and those folks are certainly, certainly critical in a time like this. I, I, I want to make sure that uh, I offer acknowledgement to those folks. Uh, but we're recognizing that there's a whole other set of critical folks that serve our communities, uh, folks that are on the front line right now, like healthcare workers, for example, something that uh, too often we take for granted. Uh, we're certainly being reminded of the importance that they have to our society today. And then I'd be remiss also if I didn't acknowledge uh, folks that are on the front line in grocery stores, in restaurants, in retail stores and so many other essential businesses where we have essential employees. Uh, this is certainly a time that uh, we should appreciate what all of those folks are doing. Um, there's, out of this crisis, I see a lot of good things happening. Uh, the first is that I, I see highlighted the good and kind human spirit that uh, sometimes we don't slow down enough to recognize and I hope that you're recognizing that and seeing it around uh, your neighborhood as well. Uh, this is a time where I see so many neighbors helping neighbors. I see folks running errands for their neighbors, going to the grocery store, the pharmacy, helping out uh, outdoors or around the house. Uh, it's, it's, it's so great, uh, even in the midst of a crisis, to see those types of things. And maybe it's just me slowing down enough uh, to see some of those things taking place. I see the, the human spirit in the, in, in the sense that we, so many of us are now pulling together that might not otherwise. I see political work, uh, political leaders working together, and for the most part, putting partisanship aside, which is extremely uh, refreshing for me. I see tremendous efforts in our school systems and uh, with volunteers to feed and educate and entertain our children, uh, all vital services at this particular time. But I also think that we need to, uh, to acknowledge and recognize some things that might not uh, be so positive. There are a lot of people hurting out there right now. I know there are a lot of folks that are sick. Uh, there are folks too many folks that have lost their loved ones or fearful that they're going to lose some loved ones. And um, a lot of folks are hurting too with the economic crisis that, that we're experiencing. 
And quite honestly, I believe that uh, business owners are making a huge sacrifice in the interest uh, to help this thing go away, to protect us. Uh, I, I think that this crisis highlights the fact just how susceptible humans are to disease. We've been so fortunate for so many years that we've been over, able to overcome so many things, but it, it, it certainly highlights a, a susceptibility there. Uh, I think that this also highlights in a land of plenty where we're so familiar or it, it's so common to go in a store and be able to put our hands on anything that we want. But in a land of plenty, we now see that we're experiencing a number of shortages. Uh, examples are test kits and uh, PPE equipment and, uh, and yes, toilet paper. Who would have ever thought that that would have been the commodity that has grown to be today? And then also, I, uh, I would be remiss if I didn't at least mention that there's, uh, there's in, in spite of all of the great things that are going on, there are still a few political operatives at work out there uh, that are looking to leverage this crisis uh, in, in, a, in a political way. Uh, that's certainly not the majority of the folks that, that, that I see out there, but, uh, but I, I can assure you they're there. And I'm sure the other legislators on this call recognize uh, a few of those as well. Um, and Corey, again, thanks, thanks for pulling this together in spite of what's going on and giving us a chance to chat. I appreciate Absolutely. it. Absolutely, thank you, Senator Edwards. Up next, we have S Senator Terry Van Dyne, who represents District 49. Senator Van Dyne, I'll give you a second to unmute. There you go. <laughs> thank you. Um, yeah, so uh, first I wanna start with thanking the chamber. Uh, you guys are, have been awesome. Uh, you're working with the city and the county, and you've provided not just your members, but the public with a tremendous amount of information. I send folks to your website all the time, and I am so grateful for, for all the work that you're doing. Um, it, in fact, uh, Queen Elizabeth, in her comment to her um, to her people said something that resonated with me. She said that we will get through this successfully but when we do, that success um, will be owned by all of us. And I think um, that's particularly true of Buncombe County. So um, thank you for that. So um, <clears throat> the Senate is not convening right now and that's very frustrating for me. Fortunately, the House is and um, I'm taking advantage of uh, listening into their meetings as much as possible. But Senate Democrats um, right now are hyper-focused on uh, COVID-19 recovery. And we have formed um, working groups that are looking into a number of key uh, investment areas. And of course, one of those has to be uh, public health, mental health, and crisis management, not just to get us through this phase of the disease, but the second and, and potentially third phase of this disease. So we're going to be re recommending significant investments to prepare for that, investments in um, uh, a, a robust testing plan. Uh, and and, and that, need, that means we need to have the PPE and the supplies to do that. And I'm sorry, my sisters are all texting me. Um, uh, to, to execute that effectively so that we can manage uh, this crisis going forward. Um, uh, we're also looking at recommending um, uh, uh, improvements to our unemployment um, insurance. Uh, North Carolina is behind most states in terms of uh, unemployment insurance and I think it, it particularly at this time when so many people are um, unemployed through no fault of their own without the opportunity to even look for jobs um, we need to improve both the level of um, the level of our benefits and the duration of our benefits so I'm hoping we'll be able to do that um, and I think everyone would be um, disappointed if I didn't say the words Medicaid expansion. Um, Senator Edwards may think that's being political, but I think if, if, if nothing else, um, we will learn from this crisis how important 
um, Medicaid, uh, access to healthcare is um, to our hospitals, to our healthcare providers, and particularly to the people of North Carolina. I think one of the ironies is that um, it's the folks that are stocking our grocery shelves that would most likely benefit um, from Medicaid expansion. So um, we're going to continue uh, to push for that. In terms of small business, you know, the $15 million rapid recovery loan program that the Golden Leaf Foundation launched was exhausted in less than a day. Um, we're going to, to recommend a significant investment into that program. Um, uh, I'm very grateful for the work that's being, being done by the federal government, but we know that the, there's going to be a lag in terms of access to those funds. And I think a, a great way to get our, our businesses, particularly our small businesses through this crisis, is to invest in that fund. Um, so, uh, you know, it's going to be, I think, a very intense uh, short session. Don't quite know how it's going to work yet. Um, but it ought to be interesting. And um, I'm just, uh, I, I also want to do a call out to Dr. Hathaway for making resources available to, to me and my constituents. That's been very helpful to, to pro be able to provide them with the information they need when they're panic stricken. Um, so uh, thank you for allowing me to be here and I look forward to your questions. Thank you, Senator Van Dyne. Uh, up next, we have Representative Chuck McGrady. Uh, Representative McGrady represents District 117. Representative McGrady, thank you. Glad to be here and thank you to the Chamber for hosting this. Um, I uh, represent the largest part of Henderson County, the North End, so right up against the Welcome County um, and Asheville City uh, limits. Um, as others had mentioned, it, the discussion now is just so different than it was uh, two months ago. In, in February and even early March, uh, as an appropriations chair, my, my, my instructions were to put together a budget uh, and be ready to go when we come back into session in late April. Um, that is not gonna happen. Um, as Senator Van Dyne mentioned, the House is, uh, up and functioning to the extent that we've got um, committee meetings going on. Uh, the speaker set up a COVID-19 committee with components, working groups uh, related to economic activity, health, and uh, a range of con con continuity of government and regulatory reform issues. Each of those working groups are, are uh, meeting on a regular basis. Um, I'm on the economic stability working group, um, and we're looking to see what it is we can be ready to do um, to uh, uh, address some of the COVID-19 um, uh, impacts. Uh, one of the um, bright parts of, of this, and it's hard to look for anything good coming out of the, this, but um, I will report that uh, in the House, the, um, a lot of the partisan acrimony that has uh, probably frustrated uh, those on the call as well as those in the public um, really isn't being seen right now. Um, best example of that, uh, last, this, was, this week we had these committee meetings going on and uh, we actually had Democratic chairs, in one case a freshman Democrat, uh, chairing a committee. Um, all of this is going to result in um, legislation that uh, will be introduced when we come back in. Um, and uh, we've been told the introduction will occur on Tuesday. They'll go to standing committees on Wednesday and on Thursday, uh, April 30th, uh, we're going to be back in to vote. Um, it, it'll be interesting because the process will be very different. Uh, we're not all going to come together and sit in our seats. Uh, we'll be going in uh, slowly and the voting will occur over a longer period of time to allow uh, an appropriate distance between legislators. But um, I, the House is, is moving and, and uh, I've been pretty happy uh, with the camaraderie and the willingness to work together and compromise. And uh, as for a budget, I don't expect one. 
until much later with all the tax deadlines moved back. Uh, we're no, in no position to know how, what our revenues are, much less what we have thus have to spend. And, and therefore, uh, I'm anticipating that um, after a, a two week session, perhaps in May, um, at this point, uh, we would likely come back in late June or early July to work on a budget. But that's a house perspective. Um, to my knowledge, there's no um, understanding as between the House and the Senate at this time, uh, and uh, we'll get there soon. Anyway, thank you for the opportunity to, to uh, talk about what's the ongoing work that is, is happening. Thank you, Representative McGrady. We appreciate your insight there. And I would point out that both Representative McGrady and Representative Turner are on the House Select Committee in response to COVID-19, specifically the Economic Support Working Group. Uh, we've tried to keep track of that pretty closely and we'll continue to update everyone uh, through our website. So please uh, keep an eye on that. Up next, uh, last but certainly not least, Representative Brian Turner for House District 116. Representative Turner. Thank you, Corey, and, and I want to thank everyone for signing on to, to watch us and, and to hit, be a part of this discussion. Uh, and I'm going to keep it real short so we can get to the questions that are on, you know, important to folks right now. Um, but just briefly, uh, as you mentioned, I'm serving with, uh, with Representative McGrady on the COVID-19 Select Committee, in, in particularly the Economic Support Work Group. The work of that committee right now has been primarily to talk about uh, the SBA programs that have come through, uh, the Golden Leaf loan program that came through, as well as the different uh, unemployment uh, insurance uh, benefit programs, not just the standard state ones, but also the ones that were enacted by the CARES Act that had to deal with uh, basically pandemic uh, uh, support. Um, and um, there'll probably be questions about that, so we can get into that in a minute. Um, in addition, uh, I've also been asked to work on a uh, what's being titled a regulatory relief bill, uh, which is going to address some of the, uh, the deadlines and fees and fines that are associated with doing business with the state government. Uh, they're associated with uh, uh, licensing boards. And so we're going to be looking at that and how we can uh, do some things retroactively to help people who've been impacted by that adjust some deadlines. Uh, things like that. So I'm going to be working with that um, with Representative Dean Arp. Uh, so we're starting on that work. Um, and then I think, you know, uh, one thing that's been really interesting about this crisis is that I think back to sort of my, my manufacturing days when we used to do a lot of what if analysis, a lot of five why type stuff uh, and process auditing. This is very similar to that. It feels like um, unfortunately, it's happening in real time where we're seeing where the gaps in our processes are, where we're seeing where the, the holes in the bureaucracy are. And so I think it's really important that we take this opportunity to identify those issues so that as we experience you know, future crisis, whether it be a pandemic or something else, uh, that we're better positioned uh, to, be, and to be more nimble and flexible in how we respond. Um, I know that I've, my, and, and Representative McGrady and I have talked about some of these issues in the past. But a lot of the big concerns that we're going to have for our region is, you know, what does our summer look like? What does our fall look like? Uh, you know, we have a multi-billion dollar tourism economy. And we think about all the summer camps that happen in this area. These are all industries that are going to be impacted. Uh, and so we've got to figure out how we're going to handle them. What are they going to be allowed to do? Uh, and if they're not able to function in a way as they normally would, how are we going to be able to support them? And it's not just the tourism, it's also our manufacturing. Uh, it's, it's how do we support those employees? How do we get those businesses the resources they need? Um, so hopefully we'll be able to get do that pretty quickly when we get back there at the end of April. Thank you, Representative Turner. And, and a reminder to all of our uh, folks in attendance, we have around 200 folks uh, watching. Please use the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen to ask questions. We already have a bunch piled up, so thank you for your participation. Uh, Senator Edwards, I do see that you had your hand raised. Was that an accident or did you have a follow-up? Otherwise, I'll get straight to the questions. No, I just, I, I did have a follow-up. Um, okay. And thanks, just real quick. I, I heard Senator Van Dyne express her frustration that the uh, Senate has not convened, so to speak. I can assure you and all the folks out there uh, that the Senate is very much hard at work. I'm involved in uh, two, three, sometimes four conference calls a day as a chair of a couple of key committees. Uh, we've put a call out to uh, the entire Senate, including Senator Van Dyne, asking for ideas, thoughts, concerns. Uh, Senator Van Dyne, um, I've, I've, and, 
and this direction came from Senator Berger as well as Senator Blue uh, to get with the key committee chairs. Uh, Senator Van Dyne, I'd just like to remind you that that uh, option is available to you. I've not yet received any kind of a call or email from you. So if you've got some ideas on some things that we need to be working on in terms of uh, appropriations for agricultural, natural or economic resources, a committee that I chair, or for uh, economic development and global engagement, I'd uh, certainly appreciate hearing from you. Uh, we've been in constant contact with almost every state agency. Uh, so there's, while there's no formal work groups put together, I can assure you there's a lot of activity taking place in the Senate right now uh, to prepare for when we go back into session. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Edwards. Uh, and Senator Van Dyke, I'll give you the opportunity to respond to that, but I do want to touch on this issue of the budget. Representative McGrady uh, mentioned it sort of due to the response here, due to us not knowing what the new tax revenues are gonna be in light of everything. We do have a question on it. Can you, uh, we're wondering if there's gonna be an update on passing the budget, maybe from the Senate side as well, Senator Edwards. And if folks think there won't be a budget this year, is it just gonna be the new normal in the future, the person asked. I don't think it'll be a new normal uh, at all. The house is, it's the House's responsibility to put forward the budget during this two year cycle, and we're going to put together a budget. Um, we would have put together a budget to, to start in the end of April, but for the fact that we've rolled back, you know, tax payments, we, it's very hard right now to figure out what our sales tax revenues might be. And it would be irresponsible to put together a budget that is disconnected to one's revenues. So all you're looking for from um, the House is a delay reflective of the uh, change in the revenue um, stream. Once we've got um, projections as to what the revenue will be, the House will put together a budget. Uh, I, I can't speak to or where the Senate is. Um, I'm aware that, you know, there are some budget items that uh, are, are mutually, uh, uh, well, the, the Senate, the House leadership has some interest in, um, and we just need to take some time, breathe deeply. But the, the new normal is not having a budget. No, I, I cannot imagine that's where we'll find ourselves next year uh, when the Senate uh, starts the budget process. Thank you, uh, Representative McGrady, appreciate that. Um, kind of a couple of questions in, in this vein, so this might make a lot more sense. Uh, but Senator Van Dyne, I'll give you an opportunity to respond, but also what are the chances that assuming the economy bounces back, what are the, ch the chances of rewarding, is how the, the caller puts it, the frontline troops in this war? So in other words, the healthcare workers, uh, the emergency workers that uh, Senator Edwards mentioned in his opening remarks. Um, and, and I don't think there's a need to respond other than to say that I think transparency is important. Um, uh, um, the, but the question, the, the question is a good one. And I do know that uh, uh, in, the, in the United States Senate, um, I believe it is Senator Schumer has proposed something he's calling the Heroes Fund that would um, provide, uh, I think, $25,000 bonuses to healthcare workers. So um, I don't know that we will have the resources at the state level to do that, but there is some discussion um, at the federal level uh, around recognizing the heroic efforts that um, our healthcare uh, workers are, are engaged in right now. Um, will the General Assembly take action, this is a new question, will the General Assembly take action to relax the legislative strictures around spending by the Buncombe County Tourism Development Authority? Some community members have called for the BCTDA to spend its reserves on direct support for tourism workers during this crisis uh, instead of advertising, for instance, as currently required by law. And I'll open that up to the floor, whoever has insight into that. I'll, I'll take that, Corey. You know, I think prior to the, you know, this crisis, uh, city and county elected officials have been meeting with the hotel association, have been talking about this. 
Um, the local delegation had been included in some of those conversations as well. Uh, and I think we were well on our way toward some adjustments to uh, that tax and what it's used for and the, and the different percentages and things like that. And so, you know, I feel like we were pretty close to a resolution on that and a, and a good compromise. And so I think that we'll see ourselves pick up where we left off after the crisis is over um, and then continue on that path right now. But uh, I, don't, I don't see us, you know, it took a, it's been about a nine month process to get there. Uh, and so I, I think everyone wants to be careful that we just all of a sudden don't sort of veer off to the side and go down a completely different path. So I think we'll see ourselves continue forward on where we were headed to begin with. Um, I, I would just like to add that I think it's important to recognize that it was the hotel association that started this process. Um, that's a good thing. Um, I would love to support some uh, change to, to, to the law. Obviously we're in a, in a situation where it's all hands on deck. And I know um, uh, the hotel association wants to be part of the solution going forward. And, and you both were talking about the original discussion of the change in the split and how that was spent. Is there any insight as to whether there's some flexibility right now for them to utilize more funds? I know they made a, a donation to the One Buncombe Fund uh, which our CEO is current chair of uh, the county foundation. But is there any other sort of flexibility in there to, for them to try to help out some of their uh, uh, workers who've certainly been furloughed and laid off during this difficult time? Well, the, the, the money is, you know, is basically segmented in different pots uh, and it's restricted within those pots. And so I think the donation that was made was made from funds that were, that, they're, that they had the flexibility to do that with. Um, the, the, the funds that are used from the occupancy tax are still sort of are still restricted. The governor can't uh, change that with an executive order, uh, and so those things are really locked in to where they are for right now. Um, you know, I know that uh, a lot of the hospitality groups have been doing what they can in terms of you know we've talked about food donations. Um, hotels have been donating soap and toilet paper, so everyone's been trying to step forward and do what they can at this point. Um, but as of today, the occupancy tax dollars you know are not available and nothing can free them up short of legislative action because it's the law that holds them in place right now. Okay, and that's how I understood it, but I just wanted to be clear. Um, do you think that the legislature, I assume this means y'all, not the federal, will address the interest issue for tax payments for 2019 returns that are not due till 715? Representative McGrady, I <laughs> I typed a yes to that one. Uh, I believe so. That's being considered at least in the House. Okay. Anything from the Senate side? Any insight uh, there? I know we would be supportive. Okay. Um, will there be an extension of the PPP loan program or will there be something very close to it coming up in the form of emergency relief at the state level? For those of you who are watching and might not be familiar, the PPP is the Paycheck Protection Program that uh, Congress, the U.S. Congress, put about three hundred fifty billion dollars into. As I understand, that that program is already starting to run, already basically uh, earmarked for whatever amount there was, and there was an attempt to put more money into it yesterday that failed. Um, so I guess it, this is in vain. Can we do anything at the state level in a similar capacity? And and Representative McGrady is is you know obviously on top of a lot of this stuff as well, but so much of the, of the, of the assistance that's coming through, uh, is coming through to the community, it's through the state, but it's actually federal dollars that the state administers. So we're not actually the ones who are funding those initiatives. So when you look at those SBA programs, when you look at the EIDL, when you look at the PPP, when you look at the, uh, the unemployment assistance that's coming through, through the, the three different programs, and, and I can't remember the acronyms, it's like the FPAUC or FPUC, and, those are those are primarily federal dollars that the state just administers. So we don't really have any say in how they get replenished or if they'll get replenished. Um, I know that I've had a lot of phone calls, a lot of emails from small businesses that are incredibly frustrated with the process. Uh, their, their, their banks weren't ready. They feel like that the, before they even had a chance to apply that they were being locked out and that the funds were gone. Um, and so I hope that we will see some replenishment of that. And I, I would like us to see us um, 
you know, it's like I get, I got a call from a, a, a furniture retailer, 35 employees and been banking with his bank for, you know, decades and doesn't feel like he's getting anywhere. Um, and so I would hope that if we do, we see future programs that they start to focus on, you know, not just the fewer than 500 employee businesses, but the fewer than 100 type uh, employee businesses. Those really those, those independent main street businesses that sometimes really just kind of get left out in the cold. Um, but but it, one feels like they're included when we talk about small businesses. Um, and so, uh, you know, Back to your question, if those funds get replenished, that's, that's really going to be up to the feds. Um, but I hope when they do, they'll also make sure they set aside a portion of the money for truly what I would consider small businesses, uh, main street businesses. Right. Um, and, and again, uh, what the state could do is provide significant more funds to the, the, the program that the Golden Leaf Foundation uh, began. And how much was that, uh, Senator Van Dyer, for those who don't know? Well. Um, uh, you know, um, they started with 15 million and I believe they had 95 million in requests um, within a week. Uh, I think, uh, you know, at, at, at least um, uh, I, I, it, it's difficult to say at this point because we don't really have clear revenue uh, numbers, but I think we really need a robust investment in that program. Okay. Uh, Senator Edwards, I'm going to direct this question to you. I think that uh, Senator Van Dyne did bring this up in her opening remarks. And this is coming from, I believe, a health care provider. Uh, is there an opportunity to re-examine uh, a reimbursement for people seeing and treating uninsured during this time? Access to health care is always difficult prior to the pandemic. It's even more difficult now. And the revenue boost will be huge for safety net providers and i.e. would anyone uh, consider going back and looking at Medicaid expansion or some version of it in this coming session? Yeah, Corey, thanks, thanks for the question. Uh, the, the short answer to, to that question is yes, there is plenty of room. Uh, one of those ideas is uh, Medicaid transformation, which included, I believe it was $273 million or so uh, to expand health care to North Carolinians. The issue or the problem that we've had so far is that uh, we've not been able to have any productive discussions on expanding health care uh, because there's been an ultimatum put out there, which is expand Medicaid under the terms of the Affordable Care Act or else. Uh, and so I, I would say, yes, there is certainly room to do that, uh, but we're going to need some help from the governor in um, opening up the options. Um, can I respond? Yes, please. Okay. Medicaid transformation um, does not uh, expand care to anyone. Um, it is a way for the state to limit their um, limit the liability associated with health care by privatizing health care. Um, I am not suggesting it's a bad idea because if it's implemented well, we can actually bring health care costs down by making, um, uh, um, by, by, by keeping people healthier, by getting them, um, by getting the individuals who are currently covered by Medicaid more comprehensive care. So, but it does not provide care for people who are currently not covered. And I think at a time when our hospitals are under such crisis, um, Medicaid transformation right now would be a disaster. So I like completely disagree um, with Chuck Edwards. And I would also, or I'm sorry, with Senator Edwards. I would also like to suggest um, that, and I said this at our last meeting, and I know that it's true, we have a compromise bill in the House that um, Brian Turner is a, a co-signer on. So we know there is a bipartisan um, compromise solution available. Um, we just won't bring it up, I believe, um, that we would have seen it in the House. There's no way to know this, but um, but that they won't bring it forward because they know Senator Berger won't bring it forward in the Senate. And so what's the point? Um, th this is um, a stalemate that has caused 
um, I'm sorry by Senator Berger. And uh, it's beyond time to do the right thing. And um, our hospitals need it, our healthcare providers need it, our people need it. Um, and we just need to do it. Senator Edwards, I know you have your hand raised and want to respond, go ahead. Yeah, I, I can't help but point out that uh, Senator Van Dyne's by by her own admission, she said that Medicaid transformation could lower the cost of health care overall. I, I need to point out that when you lower the cost of health care, you're making that available to more folks. And uh, I, I, I just can't let that point get by. Thank you. Um, it will lower the cost of health care if it is done success successfully over the long term it will provide additional health care to no one. Okay. Any, uh, Representative McGrady or Turner have anything to add to that discussion? I know it's a big one. Um, it's been all over the state, but. No, I think we got a lot of other questions we need to get to. I agree. <laughs> okay. Um, what should we tell, we have a question here. It's very specific about this individual who's having an issue with their unemployment claim. But what should we tell folks who are waiting on their claims is pending? What, where should they go? Who can they contact if they run out of resources and they're getting anxious? Yeah. Um, Corey, can I jump in? Oh, sure. Yes, please. Um, I would urge them to call the governor's office. Uh, the administrative branch has the responsibility to oversee the Department of Commerce, which oversees the Department of Employment, uh, uh, the Department of uh, Employees, uh, DES. And uh, we've had a lot of frustration with the response from that department. Uh, there's no question that that agency could not have been prepared for 400,000 or so unemployment claims in two weeks. This, this is unprecedented. Uh, but in the first few days, we recognized, the governor's office should have recognized where we were at, and they've been extremely slow to deploy resources to bring in additional IT staff. Uh, the Senate sent a letter pleading uh, for DES to hire additional folks to pull in resources, and uh, quite, quite honestly, we've been disappointed with the response there. And so it's, I, I need to highlight that it's the executive branch's responsibility to run that agency. Um, they can still call my office and I'll do what I can to, to, to run interference. I've done that with a number of folks, but it certainly is an issue that. Um, uh, it, okay. Uh, all true. Uh, but first it is not true that there has not been a response. Um, the department of employment security, um, has hired, um, already 35 people. Now that doesn't sound like a lot, but just imagine trying to hire people at a time when you're not supposed to leave the house. They have brought um, IT resources from other departments and they have contracted with a call center that currently has um, 50 people. They are ramping that up to um, 200 people within the next couple of weeks. Um, the call, the call volume has increased by a hundredfold in this two weeks. I think it's really unfortunate that um, uh, Senator Edwards would make this political. Um, but I will echo, if anyone wants to call me, um, my LA is spending her entire day following up with um, unemployment uh, claims. Um, I, I do want to assure people that as um, that although we did make it more difficult, we, the General Assembly, the Republican-led General Assembly in 2013, gutted unemployment insurance. We made it more difficult to get. We made it, um, the duration of it, uh, more limited, and we severely cut um, benefits through unemployment, and we cut staff to implement the program because we knew fewer people would qualify for those benefits. So they left us in a very difficult situation to um, be able to respond to the huge need that's out there. But the department has been working 
literally around the clock on this. Um, they expect um, that the, um, and I'm sorry, I get the alphabet soup of the CARES Act mixed up, but they expect to be getting the federal um, benefits for um, uh, the, the additional 600. Um, they expect to be able to process those by the 9th of April. Um, by the end of April, they expect to be able to address the needs um, that are uh, of our independent contractors and self-employed. So th they're making actually um, huge uh, improvements in the system every single day. And um, do we have a long way to go? Absolutely. Um, but I think um, people are working very hard uh, to provide the best level of service that's possible. The other thing that they have done is they have worked, um, I want to do a shout out to Nathan Ramsey. Um, they've worked to distribute some of that work uh, to our local NC Works uh, folks so that um, they can process more claims more quickly. So um, they've put more resources on it. They've taken existing resources from other departments and they've worked to distribute the work across the state. Um, I think that's an awful lot to accomplish in, in this month um, while you're also responding to literally hundreds of thousands of claims. Representative McGrady, I know that the working group heard an update from the uh, unemployment insurance undersecretary. Can you, what are validation are you getting or is, are, is there gonna be more resources put to this? Cause obviously it's overwhelmed system right now. The story I heard from the, uh, the person who just sent that question is not uncommon. I've heard it a few times now uh, in, in different town halls we've done. So what, what, are, what are we doing as a state to try to keep up uh, and uh, make sure that we're you know, uh, answering these claims in an unprecedented crisis? In every call I believe I've been on with the uh, Cooper administration, um, uh, one of the assistant secretaries, I, I can't remember his name right now, but uh, has been on the call because there's a, a huge awareness of what the problem is here. Um, and um, unfortunately, um, they're taking calls of a volume they have never seen before, like five and 10 times the volume they ever been, have ever seen before. Is the system overwhelmed? Yes, it's overwhelmed. Have they hired new people? Yes, they've hired new people. Um, we can look back and say, you know, are they, were they ready for this? Uh, could they have done more? But at this point, what's what's the point of that? Um, my view is that the administration is trying to bring the resources to bear on the problem. Um, they're not going to be able to fix the computer glitches and whatnot quickly, but we're being told um, those checks are already begun to go out and that one should expect um, a week or two uh, from the time that new claims are being put forward um, to get the check out the door. So um, it is an administration issue. Legislators, you know, really don't have a role, but I, I will say that the administration seems to understand they've got a big problem and are trying to bring the resources to address it. Hey, Corey, I just wanna jump in real quick and talk about one of those programs. The, uh, the PUA, the Pandemic, Pandemic Unemployment Assistance Program, um, which is going to be the program that is available to independent contractors, um, freelancers, 1099ers. Uh, that is a program that um, those, that group of, of, of employee or worker has never been eligible for an unemployment benefit before. And so they're basically having to start from scratch in terms of building a system to accept those applications and process them um, along with the federal guidance that they just got, I think, this past week. So that's the part that's going to be open April 25th. So for the businesses and the, and the, and the, and the folks out there um, watching this, if you are an independent contractor, if you're a 1099 employee, the PUA program should be up and running starting April 25th. Um, and that would be that would be your opportunity to uh, to apply for some unemployment assistance. 
um, you know, I, I'm, a, I'm a commercial real estate broker. I'm an independent contractor. You know, uh, Buncombe County said real estate wasn't essential for several weeks. Um, thankfully, that's been fixed. Uh, but, uh, you know, but there are a lot of folks out there like me who are going to need this uh, assistance. And that's when it was going to be available, April 25th. Okay. Thanks for that update. And, you know, the two things that we really pointed out and liked as a business community in that executive order that the governor issued on this was one, the employers are no longer burdened uh, with the claim. Um, and also the they can also automate the claims on behalf of their employees, which were two big upgrades as far as we saw it. I want to end on a lighter note. We've got a really good question here. We're headed towards uh, uh, Friday. It's, it's a holiday, but it is uh, typical that Friday happy hours happen all over this area. So someone has asked, as alcohol sales have been strong during this crisis, is there any chance North Carolina will allow selling of pre-mixed single serve cocktails from craft breweries at, at craft breweries or in grocery stores? And I think this sounds like a Chuck McGrady question to me. It is a Chuck McGrady question. Uh, I wish I was, uh, I could make that so, but that's not the law right now. And so to go to get to that position, we would have to change the law. And I, I doubt given everything else that's moving, uh, we're going to take on a issue that, that, uh, uh, you know, are, can be very controversial. Um, really from a, a social conservatives versus, um, um, more libertarian types uh, continue to have a debate about just what the role of the state ought to be um, in um, controlling and, and regulating alcohol consumption. Um, personally, yeah, I'd love to support that. Uh, I suspect that the same people that would normally drink uh, mixed drinks at restaurants and, and whatnot are now making them at home, having bought their uh, uh, liquor from uh, the ABC stores um, and it would be a quick way to get money to the uh, restaurant and tourism and people but um, unfortunately no I don't see that happening uh, there's just so much else um, on the agenda and um, the oxygen has just been taken from the room in terms of those sorts of uh, adjustments in my opinion right and uh, thank you for that, Representative McGrady. And I think that's a, uh, an interesting one to end on. I would like to see by shaking of heads up or down, do we think there is actually going to be a short session beginning on April 28th? Are, are you, will you all actually be going down to Raleigh? Yes. Okay. okay. I'm short. <laughs> We're told we'll be there to vote on Friday the 30th, I believe it is. Okay. Committee so hearings on the 29th and bills introduced on the 28th. Okay. Well, we'll definitely be on the lookout for that and, tr and tracking it. Um, I want to thank everyone for coming again and for tuning in. I say coming for tuning in to our, to our uh, virtual legislative luncheon today. I really want to thank our legislators uh, for joining us and taking time. I know you all are swamped right now with a lot of concerned citizens, uh, Senator Terry Van Dyne, Senator Chuck Edwards, Representative Chuck McGrady and Representative Brian Turner, thank you all. Our thanks to Mission Health and all of our sponsors for all your support and everything you've done uh, to help make this event a reality. Uh, we hope to have our in-person wrap up come this fall once the short session's over, but uh, no guarantees as of right now. But for, we, we really hope that we can still do that for everyone. I also want to extend uh, a heartfelt thanks to Senator Van Dyne and Representative McGrady who are uh, retiring after this this uh, year. They will no longer be our senator and our representative in this area. And we have been quite honored to have, really we have just phenomenal representation up here in the mountains in Western North Carolina. Um, I would put our quality of our legislators against anybody across the state. Uh, but you, uh, but both of you have definitely uh, have always had our area's interest at heart. And uh, from the Asheville Chamber and our community and our 1,700 members and 80,000 employees for those members, we want to thank you for your service and also thank Representative Turner and Senator Edward for your continued service um, in the years to come. Um, thanks everyone for tuning in. That'll conclude our 2020 legislative luncheon. Be safe, stay at home, stay healthy. Um, and again, www.ashvillechamber.org forward slash coronavirus for more updates. Thanks everyone.